September 13th, 1984. Yes, sir. I'm Joe Todd, and this is an interview with Mr. Tom Judy. Okay. Sir, where were you born? Where? Yes, sir. Here in the southeast corner of Beaver County, Oklahoma. And when's your birthday? September 21st, 1896. Who is your father? Tom Thomas J. Judy. T. J. Judy. And your mother? Adelaide B. Judy. Her name was Wood to begin with. Wood, okay. Where are your parents from? My mother's from Virginia. The father from Kentucky. What kind of work your father do? He's a cattleman. Cattleman. Mm -hmm. When did they come to Oklahoma? 1886. They settled in Beaver County? Yeah. How come they came to Oklahoma? Well, it's kind of a long history. Their mother was in Virginia father in Kentucky, born just before the Civil War. Both armies went back and forth through the country. The mother's father was in the rebel army, and the father's father in the Union Army, his brother in the Confederate Army. Everything was just in a turmoil after the war. Both armies had been across their farms. They were all taking their horses, cattle. There were, wasn't any future ahead for them there. Uh, mother's people moved to Missouri. The father moved, came to Missouri. It's where he met my mother. They were married there. There wasn't much was to do in Missouri. They went to Texas, in Texas for a while, down around Wichita Falls, and then came up to Kansas. And when this country opened down in here, in 1886, they came here. Hmm. They were down in the southeast part of the county on Kiowa Creek. Did they set up a ranch? No, they tried to farm. Farming was a failure. And my father went to work for a, well, they freighted all the buffalo bones to Dodge City and hauled freight back to country stores. What did they do with the buffalo bones? Well, they killed buffalo all over this country. Killed them off. And the bones were, killed them off for the hides. And the bones were thick all over the country. They could haul them to Dodge. They were sent somewhere for fertilizer, mm -hmm. soil fertilizer. And that, to get enough made 90 miles up there at five dollars for a load of bone and haul something back for the stores and ranches. Went on that way and got a job buying cattle for a, some man east of here, bought them on a commission save the money and buy a few cattle of his own and finally got into the cattle business. And you want to follow anything else they did? Yeah, tell me about how was a cattle drive organized? How does how does it work? Well, they get a herd together 
outside and know where they were taken. We have a wagon, all the supplies, bedding for the men, and they'd have uh, herd the horses, they called the remuda, and have extra horses for the men. And the wagon would take off and try to have the herd follow it. boss would go ahead and pick out a suitable campground for them for the night and they'd have to cook, cook a, some kind of a supper for them and herd would have to be herded during the night, men would have to guard it all night and take turns about probably two men on guard and they'd at a certain time they'd one of them come in to wake other guards they'd take over and then try to be ready to graze the cattle a while early in the evening and be ready to take off early in the morning so that day after day what would they be guarding the cattle from at night? Keep from scattering, going back home. No fence. Yeah. Nothing. To, mm -hmm. Didn't have corrals. They put them in. How many head of cattle would be on the cattle drive? Well, that depends. Sometimes just a limited number for uh, taking them to market somewhere. Those old time drives. Well, the time I was born, my father said they generally had 2,500, 2,000. They tried to take bigger herds, but they had trouble finding water or grazing places for them. Mm -hmm. So they cut it down to not more than 2,500. Where were they driving the cattle to? Well, those that came out of Texas and most of them were going north to some shipping point. What, Dodge City or? Dodge City was one, and some was on East Caldwell, Kansas. At one point, earlier than that, they drove on into Kansas to Atchison, Atchison, Kansas. How many men would be on a cattle drive? How many riders? Yeah. Well, it depended on the number of sided of herd. Mm -hmm. His father said that generally oh, eight, as many as eight, tried to have that many. Mm -hmm. And what were their different jobs? What were their duties? Well, they got the cattle strung out and started. Uh, to try to keep them in a long line, some riders on each side, see that the cattle didn't leave the herd, keep moving towards their destination, and also to see that outside cattle didn't break into the herd. Mm -hmm. What about strays? What would they do about? Well, most generally, they're somewhere they didn't want to let the strays in. Sometimes along the road, there'd be a man appointed to, by the local cattlemen to look the herd over the strays and cut them out, try to leave them on that range and get them back to their owner. Mm -hmm. What about the men that brought up the end of the the cattle herd? What were they called? Well, cowboys, cowhands, riders. Mm -hmm. Was that the dusty job behind the herd? Oh, those drove the drags. Yeah. 
That's a dusty job. Mm -hmm. What about the cook from the chuck wagon? Well, he was an important man, but he uh, did all his cooking out in you know, campfire. They had, had stretch a, a fly, as they called it, a big canvas over the side of the wagon that make kind of a shelter, but the fire was outside. And that had a Dutch oven. You've seen Dutch oven, then? Yes, sir. They cook in Dutch ovens, boiled coffee, potatoes, beef, beef, potatoes, coffee with the biscuits, sourdough biscuits. Carried that sourdough with them, keep adding to it. Mm -hmm. Um, where would they get, where would they burn for fuel to cook? Oh, if they could, they'd get wood. And every time they see any wood they could get, why they'd get it. If they couldn't, they'd use cow chips. They tried to have some wood carried it underneath the wagon, carry a cow hide, had Kindling and wood in that, some that be dry, so they at least get a fire started. Mm -hmm. They gather any decent wood they could get. A lot of the country, like through here, uh, settlers used up nearly all the trees and the wood. Didn't, didn't look then like it does now. Mm -hmm. Everything was bare except around people's homes, be trees there. Cow chips is the main fuel I can first remember. What would they do in case of a stampede? Well, they try to follow the herd, and then after they kind of ran down, they first they try to circle them if they could, so they wouldn't go too far starting point and they could get them circled and get to milling and finally slow themselves down. Mm -hmm. But if they kept going they'd run for several miles where they retired. And I guess the wagon would try to follow up and get to them mm -hmm. and start over. Mm -hmm. Sure hated to have a stampede and broke away once and got to where it was a habit with it and keep trying. Mm -hmm. What would it call the stampede? Oh, lightning, thunder is one thing, or a coyote show up and howl. My father said that caused them a lot of trouble. I would show off to one side and let out a howl after the cattle had bedded down and gone to sleep. He said that if they were, while they were grazing, it didn't excite them so much, but if they'd already bedded down, something aroused them to be on their feet and gone. Would the cowboy sing the cattle at night? How's that? Would the cowboys sing the cattle at night? Those that were on night herd didn't, but the other men unsaddled, slept near the saddle, used it for a pillow most generally, and then try to have a fresh horse in the morning. But the men that were on night herd, they left their horse saddled. Had horses, nothing get a fresh horse at night for the night herd. How would the the cowboys and the night herd keep the cattle calm? Well, you hear them tell about the singing to it. Mm -hmm. Say that helped that it wouldn't the cattle would 
hear them coming wouldn't stampede, wouldn't drive them. They'd circle around. There were two riders. They'd circle around, meet one another, turn back or go on the rest of the way around. Just depend on the conditions, what their orders were. When did the cattle drives finally end? Oh, those big ones ended after they got the railroads through. They got railroads in Dodge, all through Kansas. They went west from, this railroad went west. The next shipping point was Trail City, Colorado. I believe it's Colorado. Maybe it's New Mexico. Way on west on the same road, same railroad. And those were, they weren't driving very far when I could first remember. And 19, 5, 10, it about played out long drives had in this country. Mm -hmm. What did you start to school? Down east here about 12 miles toward Riverside, the red schoolhouse. Was it one of them schoolhouse? Yes. How many students went there? About eleven. Who was your teacher? First teacher was a man from Kansas, named George Cassidy. Next one was neighbor lady, neighbor girl, name of May Maple. Mm -hmm. One from Inglewood. Maud Baldwin, and one from over on the Simran, Nero Berigree. By that time, the country had settled up, and the range cattle business was over with. The father handled steers. He went back into Flint Hill to Kansas to buy steers here in Texas take them back there, winter them, and graze them on that long grass, ship them to Kansas City, and start over. Mm -hmm. Hmm. How many years did you go to school? I went to country school, I think seven years six or seven years. Mm -hmm. Went to one school, one year in town, eighth grade. And four years in high school. One year of college. Yeah. War of one ended my book education. Where'd you go to college that one year? Manhattan, Kansas State. Mm -hmm. What were you studying? Started in on, I was taking a looking forward to being an electrical engineer. I was taking the, all I got was a freshman engineering course. I took in English, blacksmithing, a lot of mathematics, geometry, mechanical drawing. Tell me about World War One. What part of it? Were you drafted or did you enlist? Oh, I, I was old enough for the draft. I enlisted. Mm -hmm. My father remembered the Civil War. He told me that, well, at that time they were men to register if they were producing something that the Army needed, they'd defer them. And 
my father told me, he says, they sure don't be. He says, I can have you defer it. But he says, don't want to do it. He says, that's causing some other man to go. He says, after the Civil War, those men that evaded it, they had a hard time living it down. He told me that if you get into something, that, well, I've been a, worked in the garage as a mechanic, says if you get into something that's more interesting than that slogging in that mud and fighting, says don't hesitate to do your duty, whatever it is. I had a friend that in the Signal Corps as a mechanic, so I tried to enlist in it, went to Wichita. It had been closed just a few days before. He told me they were organizing a motor transport corps, and they needed men for that, said they needed them badly in France. So I came home talked to my father and mother, and I went on to Enid, that is the nearest recruiting station, enlisted there, sent me to Oklahoma City, from there to Denver, from there to Jacksonville, Florida, and took the examination along the way. Then at Jacksonville, they grouped us together, gave us all the tests for overseas and we could, there only a short time, then we're ready to go overseas. What did you take basic training? I did more drilling at Manhattan in the Cadet Corps. I didn't get, didn't do much drilling in the Army. I'd already got more okay. training there than most of the recruits got in the Army. And we got to, we were supposed to have gone to New York. We got the orders crossed, sent us to Newport News, Virginia. And about 200 of us in a group, all of them were motor transport men, but we weren't an organized company. We just like a bunch of uh, stray dogs picked up. We got the Newport News. They told us then we had guards around us, didn't have any food. That way for a day or two we slipped out and ate in artillery kitchens. Army major showed up, told us there'd been a mistake made. We were supposed to go to New York. He says, there's a convoy of ships ready to go to France. You'll cooperate with get your equipment, get you out of here. Well, I, he I sent in wagons. We went with these wagons and hauled in our boxes of things for overseas equipment. They checked us out, got new packs for us. The next day, marched down the hill, got on the ship. Seventeen big ships there, troop ships, ready to go. Just twelve men got on after I did old convoy pulled out. We've been, having been missent, there it delayed everything. They waited long enough, got us loaded. So, took us 17 days across the Atlantic. Anything happened on the trip? Sir? Anything happened on the trip over? Oh, they were Look for submarines all the time, expecting. They had 
several destroyers with us. They scouted around on the outside like dogs on guard. They had one cruiser, they said it was an old time one, on the way over. Oh, it been out several days. One ship caught on fire. Man, you can see that smoke boiling up out of it. Burned all day. And then, and see, it burned all night. Started late today. It burned all night. Next morning, it's still burning. We had to one big ship, that, one that they'd taken over from the Germans. The Germans had ships in our ports when we declared war. We commandeered those ships. This was a great big ship. I know the name of it. I can't think of it right now. Anyway, it they stopped the whole convoy, and this big ship pulled back near that ship that's burning, one burning loaded with nurses going overseas. Seven hundred and some of them transferred them onto this big ship, and the burning ship headed back to Halifax, Nova Scotia. The big ship went on towards France. Well, it had artillery mounted on it, better qualified to defend itself. It went on by itself. And that cut us down to 15 ships, the convoy. It zigzagged course well, this way for a ways. And Zigzag turned the other way, that is to confuse the submarines so that you wouldn't be following a straight course. No, they had submarine scares and did a lot of firing and something there one morning. And finally struck it, thing blew into the air. I saw the officers on deck watching two glasses, they danced around, destroyed whatever it was. Then we don't know yet whether it's a submarine or what it was. Went on then somewhere south of Ireland, hit a lot of wreckage there. Ships had been torpedoed. This big German ship that had gone on with the nurses, its load of men, it got unloaded and met it coming back. And we landed at Brest, France, dropped anchor there. Ships couldn't dock at the pier had transferred troops to lighters, as they call them, mm -hmm. small ships, load them into where they could unload the dock. We got there you know, before night, didn't have any supper, and had to take out the, all the hatches, and get everything cleared off, didn't have any breakfast. Unloaded us then on these, off these little bar, little bar, little lighters as they called them. Started up that hill to breast. Men were weak and sick, and they thought I couldn't make it. Pulled out. It started raining now. For a while we tried to keep on our feet whenever they tell us to halt. 
they lie down, got to where it didn't matter if the water was two inches deep and flopped down and you think you couldn't make another step, look way on the head, on the heel, see a yellow ribbon up that hill. That was four or five men abreast. They didn't think, well, other men made it, but I tried to too. We made it then. A lot of them did. A lot of them. Ambulance, ambulance brought up the rear, brought up some of them. But you interested in anything beyond that? Yes, sir. Well, we didn't get anything to eat until they told us that they were setting up a kitchen and if we send men to help and have some coffee and bread for us sometime that night. So another man and I, I was appointed acting corporal. We went on duty. We got a loaf of bread and coffee. One of the boys got some canned beef hash. He filled up on that. And the next morning, I got kind of organized. I had a pretty fair feed the next day. And then they went to barracks, stayed one night. Next day we're loaded on the French train, third class coaches, the doors on the side, and put eight of us in the space where they're supposed to be, only six, eight of us in their packs. I don't remember how long we were on it. We landed and stopped at a little town called E-C-E-C-I-Z-E. -E -E -E. And then uh, they uh, to a point where Judas Caesar's army had been way back there in Roman time. We were there for a short time. I did a little drilling, training there, then I picked so many men to send to the front to drive trucks. I was one of them, and they held me back suddenly as an instructor, sent another man. The Germans shot him right in the forehead. Then they sent a number of us, sent just a few of us to Paris then. Some of us had been instructors there. And there was an old truck company in Paris, oldest American truck company there. We were attached to it. company in Paris, oldest American truck company there. We were attached to it. Went on for quite a while. I was enlisted as a repairman. They were short on mechanics. They put me to work in repairing trucks. Forgot how many men there were that were attached to the company. And they had one truck, things had gone wrong with the 
valves on the packing truck. We couldn't get the valve port out. Couldn't get the valve lifted. I told the man in charge of us, I believed I could manage that. He said, we well, just go ahead. Got a special boat and the equipment that reached down in there, managed to get the valves out. Had a string of dead truck just due to bad valve. We got them to rolling. This old fella, he wasn't old, name was Barney Gleason, her boss, Irishman from New England. He came back and says, Judy, you're a member of this company now. Well, I sure was pleased. Only one man out of 80-some that transferred into the company, 80-some attached men. I worked with them the rest of the time I was there. I worked out in the mud, snow or ice, whatever it was. Didn't have a shop to work in. We uh, tried to keep the trucks rolling. The drive had just broke out of theory. Right after that, San Miel, we called it San Miguel. French called it San Miel. And then after that, Muse Argo, and from then on to the war ended. We were out in the mud, cold all the time. Uh, had the flu all, not all winter, but one thing bothered my throat now. My hands were so cold there. They bothered me yet, but I in good health. Great. Mm -hmm. Did you ever spend time in the trenches? No, we weren't. We were up there hauling things up there for them. Saw that Hindenburg line after the Germans had been forced out of. Mm -hmm. no, uh, we had air raids there, Paris nearly every ride. Oh, about same risk as being hit by lightning in an electrical storm. Mm -hmm. Every time one of those bombs fell, it did a lot of damage. But I was smart enough, had anti aircraft firing all the time. I couldn't tell the difference between anti aircraft fire and a bomb. It all sounded horrible. Were you ever engaged in actual combat with the Germans? No. Mm -hmm. Saw lots of German prisoners. Saw lots of our boys that didn't get back. We hauled the coffins there. We reburied a dead Romaine. Hauled a thousand of the trip. They were knocked down board, boards. Boards. They'd set them up after they got there, nailed them together, plain wooden box, load those on trucks, go out to the battle area, and graves registration men had written out, they wrote plots where they buried dead. Of course, the shell fire, maybe after it blow some of them out, and they'd all go out to these empty coffins, come back, the body in each one of them, unload them there, the big uh, graves, as we call them, were just like a big, making a big, uh, big cellar, something of that sort. These great long trench, straight walls, and unload those. Men to go through there, getting the name. They had the dog tag nailed to the 
cask of the coffin. That settled that, but it came to one that they couldn't identify that they'd go into that wearing rubber coats and rubber gloves, wearing scissors, cut through the uniform, cut in pockets, anything. Any place they find anything possible possible identification. They put it in the canvas sack, try to trace it down there. Sure. Second hand. What did you do on Armistice Day? I was in Paris, working on a Ford ambulance. Everything went wild. Uh, we kept right on working. That night, told me that there was an ambulance or truck broken down, down in Paris. We were at, we were at just outside the wall of Paris, mm -hmm. the old medieval wall there. And we were out oh, a mile or so. They sent me in there to start this, get this truck out. It was a, I it was a Ford, Ford ambulance. I located it. Got it started. It wouldn't run. Go dead. We got to look at all of this swarm, crazy swarm of people you ever saw. My mom had hooked onto a German cannon and set up. Had those captured cannon pulled in there, strung all along the streets in Paris, and hooked it onto one of those. ambulance couldn't pull it. I went around there, cut the wire, and we managed to get it back home. Then we got there, we didn't have anybody to drive it. I called the jitney to go down to Paris. A certain place we'd meet there, all the men home, get them in for bed check men that had gone down there on passes. Well, they designated another man and me to do that. We went down there and of all the mobs you ever saw, people right in front, they just like driving through water. They'd give way in front, close in behind. We finally got to a destination. Got some men loaded up, gradually worked their way back home. But never saw anything like it. The One. streets full of people and they were all hilarious and crazy like. Did you do any celebrating? I didn't. And that's the way I celebrated. That the dirty, greasy clothes on. Back, back home, back to the barrack. Next day is the same thing. Bring in dead trucks, work on them out of our recreation. No, I didn't celebrate it. When were you discharged? Oh, in August following year. Kept the motor transport there. And the Germans took them a good while to find somebody who'd signed the peace treaty. They had to work out peace treaty. And then when they finally got somebody to sign it, I began to send our troops home and kept the motor transport there to do the hauling. We got out of there sometime the next July and got to get some sailors from Brest, 
compressed or sandy there. And got to New York, got back a little faster than we went. They made it in 11 or 12 days. And they sent us a group of us to Camp Pike, Arkansas, near Little Rock, discharge there. The outfit us with nearly all of them from New England, Providence, Boston. I men to work with. When did you get back here? August, sometime late August, 1919. Mm -hmm. What's the first thing you did when you got back home? Went to work. Got it, came in. Let's see. Came in on the train, and father and mother didn't know for sure when I'd be here. They thought they'd meet the train. Something delayed it. So I got off the train, walked home three miles north of our railroad station. Got down the hill about half a mile, met my folks. So they took me back home. Even the dog recognized me. He just went wild. Mm -hmm. He saw me. But I had too much to be done. Then my father's health had got bad. Had a heart condition. Had cattle to look after. Feed to put up. So I just went to work. Hmm. You mentioned the Battle of San Jacinto. You said you knew some, you heard of someone that was in the battle? Oh, the man, boy here, Bob McFarland, his grandfather was in it. What was his name? His name was the, the one that was in the battle? Yeah. It would have been McFarland. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob didn't even know about it until I told him. Hmm. Here's the circumstances. Mr. McFarland, Bob's father, uh, came up from Texas, an old-time cattleman. He and my father were well acquainted, and he came to Beaver. He used to come up in the buggy and he'd stop at the hotel, right across the street from the hotel, a liver stable where my father put the buggy and team, and when they unhooked there, <coughs> Mr. McFarland generally meet him and they'd talk and visit. He got to telling about his father, and then the Sam Houston, you hear about Houston often, mm -hmm. said he'd been with Houston at the ba battle. But he told us some details. I was young, I couldn't remember all of them. Later on, the father briefed me on them. But Mr. McFarland, the main thing I remember, what he said was that Houston went to sleep and snored so loud that the men were afraid they were poorly led. For they knew that they were outnumbered ever so many to one. And they thought Houston didn't realize it. But the events that led up to it said there'd been three different groups that had gone there to fight for Texas independence. And one group was from Missouri under and the name of Donovan, in Camp Donovan, Texas. Came for him. Another group from some part of Texas. I don't know maybe where the third one's from. But Houston would try to get them organized to go against the enemy. So they had each one had his own ideas. And maybe they wouldn't all agree on when to fight. They 
Some of them said some of them went on a hunting trip. Whole group of them. I don't know how long they were going. Finally, they all got together. And they crossed a big deep canyon. Had a wooden bridge over it. They got on the other side of this canyon and camped. And that night, Houston sent men back there to chop this bridge down so there wouldn't be any turning back. He knew that the enemy was straight ahead of him. So the next morning, uh, he told the men that leaving, there wasn't any turning back, they'd have to go ahead. Well, they caught the enemy by surprise. I forgot whether they were in, whether they were at meal time or whether the siesta hour. Anyway, they didn't have their guns right with them. They had their guns stacked, I believe. And they broke in on them by surprise. That element of surprise means everything. He said, Mr. McFarland said his father said a little bit. Men were chasing the enemy here and there just like dogs chasing rabbits. That's the way the war in battle ended up. Then they captured Santa Anna, wasn't that his name? Yeah. So that was about the end of it. But the thing that impressed me was telling about Houston laying down there and snoring. I can hear him all over Texas. <laughs> but Bob, now I didn't know about that. His father, Bob wasn't born to him. So after his father's health was bad, his father had a, a stroke and he was never alert after that, never helped him. Bob didn't know about this until I was telling him. Hmm. Mr. McFarland, my father, was a good friend, and that's where we learned that. Mm -hmm. How bad were the dust storms around here back in the 30s? You just have to see them to imagine. The wind would come up and blow the dust. The worst of it was vegetation died out, and they'd pick up dirt out in the pastures, places where Ordinarily, there wouldn't have been anything. And they had that, that one, that Black Sunday. You see that one coming from the north. And it just looked like it was rolling. It got nearer. When it got there, it went just as black as any night you were ever in. I was out looking after cattle. Cow had a baby calf, got on the horse, started to see about it. <clears throat> looked to the north, and there was this black cloud coming. It was within a quarter of a mile of it. Jumped off the horse, turned in loose, headed for the house. By that time, it hit me. I was wearing goggles. Got to where we carried goggles all the time. Put a big red handkerchief over my nose. And it hit me, I couldn't see a thing. I could tell about where the house ought to be. The fence there near me. And I was guiding myself to that fence. Got into an old bunch of old posts and boards. Then I got down and crawled the rest of the way. Got near the house. I could see something that looked about like a candle. My wife had lit the lamp and holding it in the glass door. Got on in. In the house, it just looked like fog, dirt, fog in the air. Just got in through the, around the windows. The house wasn't 
being insulated like they are now. But that was the worst one. We had lots of them. Couldn't see anything, do anything. Dirt. See, this house we were in was a house I bought, rebuilt, and moved it in there. But it was, it was comfortable, but it wasn't insulated around the windows. The dirt blew in, had the linoleum on this little kitchen floor. The morning time, you couldn't see the design of that linoleum. I could get breakfast and cleaned off that sand. A lot of people got sick from it, inhaling dirt. That something I hope never happens again. Well, I've taken up a lot of your time. I think we have a good interview. I appreciate this. Well. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you.